with all this rapid change, it'd be a brave soul who would try and predict the future of journalism. But um, I'm going to try and look at some of the trends, and particularly globally, of what's going on. Um, however, I would like to start on a positive note, not unlike what Noel was saying, that um, I certainly believe that, to paraphrase Mark Twain, reports of the death of quality journalism are very much exaggerated, and I think it has a long way to go. But it is a time of huge transitions, and there are major risks and challenges for media owners, uh, media management, and for the journalists themselves. One recent sign of the changing face of journalism came earlier this year when a Pulitzer Prize was given for the first time to a blog, or a so-called blog, to the Huffington Post. Now, there was a certain amount of grumbling that went on, etc., but uh, because the Huffington Post would be slightly better known for news aggregation, i.e. aggregating other people's news, and for, I suppose, celebrity photo galleries and things like that, not so much for, for serious reportage. But uh, to be fair to the Pulitzer Committee, it was awarded to this man, David Wood, and it was for a series called Beyond the Battlefield, which was frankly an absolutely superb series. It looked at um, wounded war veterans from Iraq and Afghanistan, and it was absolutely brilliant and, in my opinion, absolutely deserved. It was really superb campaigning and public interest uh, reporting. So really my point is that high quality reportage just could turn up in places that we might least expect. Um, so while I'm one of those that does believe that um, quality journalism will very much prevail, I would emphasise there are massive risks and challenges and management has a huge responsibility here in my view to support quality journalism. Um, it will depend hugely on management's ability to adapt their business models, to constantly learn, to embrace the new platforms and the new technologies where people expect now to read their news and their quality journalism. To give you an idea of just quite how much the world has changed, um, this, uh, I'm sure you, you know this quote extremely well from George Bernard Shaw. This may have made great sense when Bernard Shaw first said it, uh, the reasonable man adapts himself to the world, the unreasonable one persists in trying to adapt the world to himself, therefore all progress depends on the unreasonable man. Well, I'd argue that today, particularly in the publishing and media, that has changed utterly. The reasonable man is the person who's going to make the progress and they are going to have to adapt themselves to the realities of the world. Um, I suppose a very good example is to look at, from a global point of view, the New York Times. New York Times is one of those newspapers, along with people like the Financial Times, etc., who've managed to get its core readers to pay to subscribe for online news, which is quite a challenge. But the management of New York Times is constantly trying to turn the Titanic. You know, they haven't stopped there. They're always looking ahead. They're always looking at other technologies. They're constantly re-examining their models, constantly experimenting with new third-party platforms um, and more. Just recently there, in fact, just last week, the New York Times subscribers were told they were going to get full access via Flipboard. Now, I don't know how many people know Flipboard here, but it's quite a well-known um, platform. I think they had 8 million downloads to Androids, iPhones, uh, tablets, etc. by January last year. I assume that's a lot higher now. I know a lot of people who use it. Um, so subscribers can now read the entire paper on this uh, paper on this rather glamorous platform called Flipboard, as well as related videos, blogs, etc. Um, it'll look something like that. <laughs> That's not particularly a news story, but uh, they've only just literally got on, uh, online. Um, the model here is for the platform, i.e. Flipboard, and for the newspaper to share the revenue. Now, nobody knows, and a lot of people are speculating, who's going to be the winner here? Is it going to be the third-party platform that is Flipboard, or is it going to be the New York Times? The jury's very much out on that. But I use the New York Times as a sample of, a, of a, an international newspaper that really are constantly adapting and changing their models and looking to the future. Um, it, you know, as well as management, journalists also are going to have to really relook at what they do. They're going to have to be adaptable. They're going to have to be flexible. They're going to have to learn new ways of publishing, etc. A lot of the Chinese walls are going to come down. You know, it's going to retire. It's going to require adaptable and flexible journalism, journalists that are comfortable with all forms of digital content, because that is now how, as well as print, digital, you know, it's going to be digital content. That's how content is going to be delivered. 
um, you know, given the constant rate of change, you have to ask in media organisations, where does your product development or your web development team sit? Where does it literally sit in the organisation? If you look at El País in Madrid, they put their product development or web development team sitting smack in the middle of the newsroom, where they could interact every day you know, with everybody else in the newsroom, editors, journalists, etc. Ourselves at Silicon Republic, our head of online development sits in on our editorial meetings and liaises regularly with our editors and journalists. That's just the reality of today's um, publishing world. And it's this kind of innovative thinking by management that's going to ensure the survival of the incumbent um, publishers as well, much like um, Noel was discussing there. Um, they're also going to have to adapt to what they do. Things like video. Video is going to be absolutely huge. You know, journalism isn't just uniquely about writing anymore, even if you're not a broadcaster, even if you're not in radio, TV, etc. So you look at things like video, and you look at the very attractive C-suite audience, for example. Forbes recently did research, um, which I think really shows that video is not going away. You know, if you take that attractive C-suite audience, according to that research, 75% of C-suite executives are now watching business-related video on business news sites at least weekly. Now, that's pretty significant, and it's a pretty attractive audience to a lot of publishers. Uh, mobile, obviously, um, is going to also become huge. I think we're all fairly aware of that. It's a pretty huge shift, and it's going to bring absolutely tons of challenges. We're all accessing our news on the go now. We're not just you know, looking at our desktop. We're accessing it on our tablets, on our phones, etc. This is Rob Grimshaw. He's the managing director of FT.com, which is the Financial Times online. He recently said the Financial Times expects 50% of its digital audience will be accessing its content via mobile devices within the next three years. I think you, you can extrapolate out for the next five, ten years what that implies. Um, these are his words. In fact, we've got to get used to the idea that the future of news publishing is on mobile. People are welcome to agree or disagree on that. I want to actually, I do, uh, unlike Noel, want to talk a little bit about business. I want to talk briefly about advertising. Because regardless of the move towards paywalls for the likes of the FT, the New York Times, the Sunday Times, etc., it is going to, advertising is going to continue to play a significant role in paying for that quality journalism that we all, I think, agree we want to retain. Um, the bad news for traditional publishers is that their print share of the advertising dollar is obviously going down the whole time. But the good news is that, like themselves who are moving online, the, um, the online share is going up radically. I'm starting here with US figures. If you look at internet advertising in the US, in the first quarter of 2012, it grew by 15% to 8.4 billion. Now, that's the highest Q1 revenue ever measured by um, the Interact Interactive Advertising Bureau and PwC. Coming back to Europe, last year the online market grew 14.5% year on year, and that's now valued at 20.9 billion. If you compare that to the overall European advertising market, excluding online, that grew at a mere 0.8%. So that just gives you an idea of the change. So in Europe now, the um, IAB ADEX survey reckons that one in five advertising euros in Europe is now spent online, and that is just going to grow. Uh, video and mobile, by the way, so just incidentally put in those slides, video and mobile is lifting the display growth in advertising as well. That's going to grow majorly in coming years, and it's definitely something that people have to keep an eye on. This is Randall Rothenberg. He's the CEO of the uh, Interactive Advertising Bureau. And he says, marketers and agencies are clearly and wisely investing dollars to reach digitally connected consumers. Um, and wisely, he says, but I'm just wondering how wise. Here's just some research that was done last year. It's quite interesting to compare. If you look at the actual major ad spend by the marketers and the agencies versus the actual time consumers spend and where they spend it. This is the ad spend. There's nothing terribly surprising here. Huge amount of people like Noel will be delighted to see is still um, on TV, followed by print, followed by web, radio, and mobile is down at 1%. Now, that was the end of last year. I reckon that's heading up towards about 1% now. But what you need to look at is where the consumer is spending their time. That's where they're spending their time. So, no, sorry, figures differ, but this is, this is a mixture of, of research from about four different sources. So they're, they're estimating, I suppose, TV is quite good news. Print is very shocking in these figures. Uh, again, people can argue the figures. Uh, web, you can see the time spent compared to the ad spent is huge. But, I mean, the really shocking thing, I suppose, 
in this slide is mobile. If you consider the one or two percent of ad spend is spent on mobile, that's 23% of the consumer time is being spent on mobile now. I think you'll all have experience of this. I think you'll all know people, you'll have friends and family who read their news, who play, who do absolutely everything online. So basically, the, the present major challenges when it comes to content provision and to advertising reach, it's not easy to do ad platforms on mobile. You, you, if you think about that, it's definitely not easy to do. It's difficult to do it without intruding upon the reader's enjoyment of the content. And it's just, there isn't as much space. I mean, that is a massive challenge for absolutely everybody who relies on advertising to pay for their quality journalism in coming years. Just want to talk very briefly, because I know Eamon wanted us to touch on this, is um, the whole area of policy. This is um, Ben Hammersley. He was actually at the IIA. Am I right back in April of this year? Some of you may have been lucky enough to catch him. I'm personally quite a big fan. He's, as well as being the editor-at-large at Wired magazine in the UK, he's also David Cameron's ambassador to Tech City, which is very much uh, the UK's um, effort to bring a Silicon Valley-type area to, to the UK. He's also um, on the European Commission's high-level expert group on media freedom. <coughs> <coughs> Indeed, Ben makes some very valid arguments, in my view, on the area of policy. I've argued you'd hear that media organisations that flourish are going to be the ones that constantly change their business models, constantly try, and if necessarily fail, and constantly innovate. Ben argues when it comes to policy that innovation comes from getting out of people's way and allowing them to continue forward. And the most common method of getting into people's way as policymakers is to fundamentally not understand the implications of this sort of technology, because the implications, as he puts it, are terrifying, and I quote. In fact, he says, there isn't an industry the internet has touched that hasn't been utterly destroyed by that contact and completely um, rebuilt. Everything from travel to music to journalism to politics. But that's going to happen, and the quicker you relax into that and allow it to happen, then the quicker the pain will be over. Um, I believe it is the point. We've seen the results of trying to legislate without adequate understanding in recent times. Just take SOPA in the US, you'll all have heard about SOPA, um, where the industry and the man on the street, or in this case the man or woman on the internet, uh, rebelled against this proposed legislation that was coming through. US legislators, I mean, were found recounting sitting at breakfast with their teenage kids who were sort of telling them, you know, what are you doing, Daddy? You're killing my internet. All that pressure worked, and, and SOPA didn't go through. Uh, even more recently, the controversial ACTA, um, the anti-counterfeiting -counterfeit trade agreement, uh, which sparked a wave of protest in Europe after various governments signed it, including Ireland, without any great public consultation. ACTA was designed to fight the trade of counterfeit goods, but also to encourage ISPs to take cooperative measures to fight copyright infringement. Indeed, back in February, the EU's principal rapporteur, Kader Arif, resigned in protest and, and slammed the whole process as a charade. It appears now to have been dealt a uh, death blow by the EU, EU's International Trade Committee, which recently voted, I think it was 19 votes to 12 against enacting the, this legislation. And I believe the European Parliament makes its decision this week, and I think it's the first week in July, and they will use that recommendation in making that decision, so ACT is not looking too healthy. This is Alex Ross, if any of you have come across him. He's senior advisor for innovation to Hillary Clinton, the US Secretary of State. His administration, like all governments, has been struggling with this whole area of digital policy, legislation, regulation, etc. But he was in London there last month at the LeWeb conference, and you'll find that a lot of um, administrators talk more frankly at tech conferences. I'm not quite sure about what that's about, but they always do. Um, he very much addressed himself to government and to policymakers, very few of whom were in the room, I suspect, but I'll pass it on to you. Addressing himself to governments, he said they had to proceed with extreme caution when it came to lashing back on the freedom of the internet. He, he argues that the control that governments had 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago is gone and it's not coming back. He says don't fight this loss of control, don't fight this empowerment of citizens, harness it for your country's well-being, make your government more open and participatory, make it easier for people to become entrepreneurs. I believe we need that entrepreneurial spirit from our incumbent media companies, from our new media companies, and even from the very journalists we're discussing here today. It's vital that well-meaning policymakers 
listen to the experts, listen to the stakeholders before they take any extreme action. Um, and I've, on that note, I don't want to go too far over time, so I'll just leave you with um, a quote from Alex, Alec Ross again, who um, summed it up, basically, that governments need to consider this fact. The 21st century is a lousy time to be a control freak. <laughs> I'll leave it there. Thank you.